Have you ever been in a project that didn't go as smooth as you hoped just because your way of thinking and working was different than the way your client is used to working? Well, this kind of tension happens a lot. And in this episode, we'll talk about how you can actually use this tension to turn clients into a lifetime partnerships. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Sarah, and this is The Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to The Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is Sarah Schumann. Sarah is the founder of In With Forward, which is a social design organization that helps to make human services more human. In this episode, we'll be addressing some really big topics. The work Sarah does involves a lot of ethical questions and asking questions like who will actually suffer from the things we're designing. We need to be asking bigger and more important questions. And the way to do that is something that we'll be discussing on this episode. And the, we'll also discuss how it impacts the relationship you have with your client. What kind of level of trust do you need to have in order to actually ask these kind of questions and how do you get to that level of trust if this is your first time here and you enjoy these conversations make sure that you hit that subscribe button because we try to bring you a new video that helps to level up your service design skill at least once a week here on this channel so without any further ado let's jump straight into the conversation with sarah welcome to the show sarah hi mark good to have you on uh, again, somebody from Absolutely. Canada. I'm sort of on a Canada tour in the recent uh, weeks. Um, Sarah, for the people who don't know who you are, could you give like a brief introduction? Sure. So my name is Sarah Schulman, and I have the privilege of running In With Forward. We're a small social design shop based in Vancouver and Toronto, Canada. And our mission is to try and turn our social safety nets into trampolines. Hmm. So we work, you know, from the ground up with marginalized communities to really understand their perspective, doing deep research and ethnography, and then co-designing all sorts of new kinds of support models in the disability space, in the homelessness and addiction space, in the newcomer and immigration space. Uh, and really we're, we're working in partnership with uh, lots of different nonprofits and government agencies to try and create this new kind of welfare state. And for the people who are watching the video right now, we're seeing early morning traffic in Toronto, right? In Vancouver. So oh, Vancouver. 7.30 oh. a.m. traffic uh, right outside. This is East Hastings, which is actually the poorest postal code in uh, all of Canada. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, we're in the epicenter really of um, a, it's a beautiful and vibrant community that also happens to have a really high homelessness and addiction rate. For the people who are listening to the podcast, please go to YouTube and uh, check it out. <laughs> You'll see some <laughs> livelihood. Sarah, uh, this is the service design show. And I know that you haven't prepared for this question, but um, do you remember the first time you got in touch with the term service design? Cool. I do, actually. It was uh, in 2006 and it was in a bookstore in Oxford in the UK where I was doing my PhD at the time and escaping from the realities of all the research. And I went to Blackwell's bookstore. I, I had the good fortune of living right above Blackwell's. And so I could waste as much time as I wanted. And I went to a section that I'd never gone to before, which was on design. And there was a book there um, about service design and particularly how design was being used in a public sector context in the UK. And I wrote the author of that chapter the evening of reading it. And so began my journey into wow. service design and bringing the social sciences into it and uh, away from the academic track that I had been on. And of course, everybody's curious now, what was the book? The book was called Public Matters, and it was a compilation of essays about how to reform the public sector. And design was one of the methods that they introduced. Cool, cool. Um, Sarah, you gave me some interesting uh, 
topics and I always say that, but it's true. It's always true. Every uh, guest has a new and own perspective. So um, I gave you the question starters. Are you ready to do some classic interview jazz? I'm ready. As ready <laughs> as I'm going to be, I think. <laughs> okay, good. Let's see where this is going to lead us today. Because the first topic is called partnerships. And I invite you to pick All right, one of the I'll question like starters. How can we enable great partnerships? Mm -hmm. Well, partnerships between who and who and what makes a partnership great? So I'm going to build up on your question. So, you know, one of our big lessons in our work over the past decade, and we've worked in lots of different contexts in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Australia, uh, and now in Canada, uh, has been, you know, how do we find partners that share our same values and our same tendency towards disruption? Uh, you know, we cannot tip over the welfare state on our own. We are tiny. Uh, and so, you know, while we have a lot of energy and ideas, we also don't have a lot of know-how and expertise in the contexts in which we're trying to change. And so partnering with, uh, you know, institutions and organizations, groups and associations, that have um, that deep understanding of the field that we're working in has been really essential to trying to make change. But we've also learned the hard way that not all organizations, institutions, groups, and associations have the same ambitions or vision, uh, and uh, nor do they necessarily have the capacity to be able to work in disruptive and provocative kinds of ways. And so, you know, Really, our most enduring lesson has been how do we test out our partnerships? How do we determine whether it's a good fit? And we really liken it to dating. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not unlike trying to find a partner that you uh, want to settle down with. And, uh, you know, over our last five years in Canada, um, we've tried out probably, you know, 25 or 30 different partnerships. And we do short pieces of ethnographic work for about a month at a time. And we found that that work is one of the best platforms to test each other out. Can you um, give an example? Really, so, you know, five years ago, we moved into a social housing complex here in Burnaby, British Columbia. Uh, and, uh, you know, alongside three large disability service providers, uh, really began to get to know all of our neighbors in that social housing complex and use that research to uh, test, you know, 10 different ideas, um, two of which have now gone on uh, to see the light of day. But in those early days, we were really trying to learn, you know, could, it was there space for this partnership to be able to hold some of this, you know, some of these insights and um, you know, we found that the answer was yes, that there was a big appetite, that there was a willingness to wrestle with some of the big questions that our deep and immersive ethnographic work kind of surfaced. And that's not always the case. We've, we've worked with other organizations for whom when we do this kind of deep ethnographic research, the response is one um, of defensiveness or the response is one of, well, we don't have time or capacity to take this on. There's not that uh, readiness or will willingness to begin to contend with some of the, you know, the, the really profound questions that doing this work entails. And so our best partners are ones that want to get philosophical and pragmatic, uh, that have, you know, both a, a short term willingness to roll up their sleeves as well as a long term vision. Uh, and being able to hold the space for all of those things has been have been really important ingredients to, to good partnership work. Hmm. And <clears throat> Uh, do you think you're now able to spot good partnerships earlier in the phase than you were five years ago? And if so, how, what are sort of yeah, yeah the key? What what does what gives it away? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure we are. I think you know, uh, I'm I'm surprised at how challenging it can be to really find that match. Although maybe I shouldn't be surprised when we think about the odds in the dating world, um, you know, it often is a numbers game. One has to go through many different people and many different styles in order to find that best match. And, you know, every time we've tried to shortchange our partnership finding process, 
uh, we, we've, we've learned the hard way um, that that's not the way to build trust. And the way to build trust is by, you know, doing something difficult together, mm. like asking a tough research question, getting on the ground, learning it, seeing how we all respond to it, seeing if there is, you know, the leadership and the courage to be able to, to you know, honestly contend with the things that emerge. And I think um, the thing that, you know, is very true in the social sector and perhaps any sector is short term demands. The demands of just delivering services to people can often, uh, you know, is often prioritized more than being able to stand back um, and, and look at what we're doing and ask questions like, are we doing harm? And for whom are we creating good outcomes and for whom are we not? Um, and so it's it's really quite a small number of organizations that have the bandwidth and the leadership and the moral fortitude, I think, to ask some of those really big questions. And that those questions are the heart and soul of our work. And so um, if it's an organization that's not willing or able to do that, um, it, it often ends up being a really challenging and tricky and tough um, set of relationships. And, uh, and we just learned that even this month. So five years into, into our <laughs> Canadian experience, we continuously relearn that. <laughs> I, I, many questions around this topic, but we have other topics which are interesting as well. So Sarah, let's, um, uh, we'll, we'll get probably into partnerships later on, but let's, uh, explore topic number two, okay. which has the title ethical implications and maybe that also involves partnerships <laughs> maybe i'll go for why should we consider ethical implications well yeah. that's a really good question you know it, the work of uh, of service design broadly, which I think is, you know, how do we design great experiences with and for people? And then in social design in particular, which is how do we do design experiences that are actually transformative, that can actually create change with and for people, um, are both questions that are profoundly ethical. They're questions about figuring out what is good for whom, in what circumstances, under what conditions. Um, and they're, they're inherently questions that involve um, uh, preferences and interpretations about uh, the very nature of what constitutes a positive outcome. And so, you know, they deserve to be, uh, you know, I think I've used the word wrestled with a few times this morning, but but they deserve to have that sense of, of deep and profound engagement with, with those concepts. And, you know, our work in particular is, is even an, another step deeper, which is we're working with folks that are traditionally marginalized, working with folks that might be experiencing homelessness or addiction uh, or uh, mental health challenges or who might be new to the country and whose voices often haven't been heard in traditional processes and whose interests can often be manipulated politically quite easily. Uh, and so in a, in a context in which historically we've done very poorly by these folks, the ways in which we uh, listen to people, the ways in which we represent people, the ways in which we partner and build relationships with people, the kinds of expectations we have with folks are all questions that um, are deeply ethical and, and require us to look at the gray zone, not just the black and white, not just get caught up in the trend of design or innovation and not see design and innovation as neutral, as inherently good things. Uh, they have a shadow side and I see the shadow side more often than not. Like and what? So Can you again, time shadow yeah. sides like what? <laughs> well, you know, I, I see a lot of um, quite unsophisticated design that inadvertently reinforces the status quo rather than challenges it. Uh, and so, you know, the trend uh, these days is, you know, digital services, or the trend is coordinated data sharing, all of both of which, um, for many folks on the margins can leave them worse off, mm. who gets to see their data, we assume that getting social workers and, you know, housing workers and all of the constellation of people on the same page uh, is a good thing, but actually that reinforces the notion that professionals have a lot of power. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, you know, contend with the history of professionalization as something that might be quite negative for folks on the margins. 
Same with digital services, the notion that, you know, just putting things online or an app or a smooth, you know, service journey flow in that medium is the best way to really address um, some of the structural reasons why folks on the margins are on the margins is is quite superficial thinking. And so I think in, in the, you know, we can spend a lot of money and a lot of time on uh, jazzing up um, old versions of things and making the old appear new rather than actually sitting to unpick and unpack what are the core ideas and assumptions that are animating our current services? And if we really want a different kind of welfare state for folks, we have to start with different ideas and assumptions, not just nicer products and services. Do you? <clears throat> those are big questions. And I wonder, how do you actually put this into practice? Do you have like a framework to address ethical questions or does it happen spontaneously? How do you approach this? Yeah, great question. I think, you know, for us, um, having some team routines and some space to be able to ask big questions is one piece of the puzzle. We have a, a Monday huddle where we identify priorities and also inspiration from other sources to help us read and, and pull apart some of these big ideas. And then we have a Friday reflection session every week for two hours where we pose some questions that are on our mind. We do some writing, we do some group uh, conversation and discussion. Uh, we have a, a resident philosopher, we call him, uh, who uh, is is the director of innovation for, for one of our large organizations, Possibilities, and uh, who, who often comes to the table with um, some of these big questions or provocations or prompts. Um, we do a lot of reading and part of my role on the team as the kind of lead social scientist is to bring to the table articles and books and um, you know some of the latest science and thinking out there. And, uh, and so in each piece of work we do, we start by um, you know developing a bit of a literature review, going to this going to what's out there. Um, and um, you know as much as we can, uh, writing about it. And I think writing has been an important part of our practice. Um, it's not one that, that all of our designers love, um, but you know, taking the time to not just um, create um, beautiful things, but also to deconstruct and analyze and that kind of analytic and creative thinking needing to go side by side. Um, so those are some things we try. It's, well, that's it's a lot. Enough, yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically what I'm hearing you say is having the time to reflect and also actively provoking a discussion um, and a writing for me is it's almost never about writing itself but it's about the process of thinking what to write and then the words are just an expression of uh, totally. thinking so you are really deliberate and you are creating mm -hmm. the conditions in which at least uh, mm -hmm. you increase the chance that you'll have a conversation about the implications right that's the hope and you know I think as any of us that have uh, Sillily done a PhD will tell you, you know, there's all you could always spend more time reading. There is always more provocation and prompts that uh, that could spark, um, you know, better thoughts. Uh, and so we do what we can in the context of, you know, quite busy project work. And how, um, yeah, you're deeply involved in, uh, into ethical implications because you're dealing with minorities, for instance. Is there um, mm -hmm. Uh, a lesson we could bring into the regular service design practice, which would be a first step into having more of these conversations. If so, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, taking the time to ask better questions, and uh, you know, when I look at a lot of the briefs that um, service design colleagues, or when I go to service design conferences, I see are the starting point. They deserve um, a more robust critique from uh, not just uh, the starting point of, of pragmatics or business model, or but but from you know, let let's take an ethical lens to it. So you. Know, you know, in, in the policy world, for, for those that um, have some familiarity with it, you know, often uh, we take a particular lens when we're analyzing a policy. We take a gender lens and we might do something called a gender analysis where we read the policy from the perspective of how might this policy impact on gender and sexuality. Um, and, you know, there are many, many different different kind of marginalized groups, that's a common practice in, in the policy world, is to kind of try and think from that perspective mm. and at least anticipate 
some of the questions. Um, and, you know, I think that that would be a good practice for designers to get into as well as every time there's a brief is to is to ask things from multiple perspectives and ask like, what is the shadow side? You know, I think we're seeing this right now with uh, social media, for instance, uh, and, you know, large scale ventures like Facebook and, and Twitter who, you know, seem astounded that there is a shadow side, that, that that wasn't something that was at least part of the discourse, of course, or or predicted 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, I think we've got to get better at from the start of things asking the really tough and uncomfortable questions about what harm can also be created yeah, through this. Yeah. And how do we do research on the harm at the same time that we're doing research on the possible opportunity space? I'm, I'm thinking about the question uh, at the start of a briefing, like who will suffer and who will benefit from the yeah. thing where... So if, if, if I would have to start somewhere, that would probably be one of the questions that I would like to ask myself. Like, mm -hmm. usually the benefit is quite obvious, but who will who will suffer from the thing we are designing? Might be yeah. might be something interesting to explore. Yeah, what? absolutely. <clears throat> We're moving fast. Let's move on into topic number three, and uh, we'll have more time for this one as well. Um, Widges. You gave me topics that, uh, again, nobody else came up with. Tension. I don't think we've had this one. We've had over 250 topics and tension hasn't been one of them. Okay, there we go. So yeah, how can we recognize that tension is an inherent part of creativity? What kind of tension are we talking about here? Well, you know, this goes back full circle to our conversation at the start about partnerships, which is, you know, when uh, we're bringing uh, different stakeholders and groups together, uh, tension is an inherent part of uh, the relationship. Uh, we've got different interests. Uh, we have uh, different preferences. Um, and how do we hold the space for both rather than either or? And so increasingly in our practice, you know, we're using, you know, yes and yes, how can we acknowledge that the current service system is one that, you know, is built on a sense of certainty, a sense of accountability, a sense of structure and rules? And how do we create the space for emergence, for, uh, you know, agility, for, um, you know, the gray zone rather than the black or white uh, and so, you know, in in our best partnership work, we are taking the time to acknowledge and identify and name the tensions. And rather than swing too far from one side to the other, try and find the space in between. Um, and, you know, we've found that by simply giving uh, these sorts of things um, a language and not, not you know, not uh, the implicit judgment, um, that that we've created, you know, a much more fertile ground for us to be generative. Um, I think in the old days there was an implicit, you know, we would we would be very judgy of like, oh, this is an organization, and they just don't get it. They don't get that we um, need, you know, a, a, a playground. They don't get that the rules are confining. They don't get um, that uh, we can't be certain about anything, and we have to allow ourselves to just experiment without an outcome in mind. Um, and that judginess. Uh, would go both ways. They would look at us and say they're amateurs. They don't understand the gravity of what they're working with. And that judgment would be beneath the surface, but it would affect all of our conversations. And um, it would create a sense of doubt and mistrust between the other side. And so taking the time to bring all of those doubts to the surface and say, it's not that emergence is better than structure and it's not that structure is better than emergence. It's that there is a time and place for both. And how do we make, how do we figure out what time this is? Um, and, you know, how do we be intentional and deliberate at um, figuring that out rather than just swinging from one side to the other? I think, <coughs> sorry, the tension is, well, at least the, th the way you're describing tension is probably something that a lot of service designers experience because just the way of working, the mindset, their approach is usually different than our clients are used to. So there is a natural tension, but it's often yeah. unspoken. It's often, like you said, um, under the surface. Uh, I, w I was trying to, uh, you said like giving it a language. Um, mm -hmm. Could you, could you be more explicit? What did you mean with that? How do you give uh, this tension a language? Is it by creating new briefing statements or what happens? 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, in our case, uh, Gord Tellick, who's the director of innovation at Possibilities, uh, and myself have collaborated on writing a book that will be out this year that um, has given um, you know some words to all of this. We've named the top tensions that we have seen in our work together over the last five years, and um, by by calling it something, so you know the structure emergence tension. Every time we see it, we can we can talk about it. And this is a common practice in, in narrative therapy and in, in many other schools of thought about team working, which is that when you can say, oh, that's this or that's that, when you can spot it mm -hmm. um, and get good at spotting it, um, it becomes um, a shorthand for you. And it's like, ah, that's what we're feeling right now. Actually, this whole hour that we're debating about, you know, whether you use your HR process or my HR process, is actually a debate about structure and emergence. What can we learn about that? Um, and so it kind of deflates the, the conflict. And instead of trying to shut down the conflict, it, it kind of opens up it into a new space. Um, and I think you know what I've seen, particularly in the social sector, although I think this is true in most sectors, uh, is that the, you know we assume that anytime there's a disagreement or conflict, it's bad. And we try and get rid of the conflict. We try and fix the conflict by making a decision. And generally, the decision is on one side or the other side. We're going to use your rules, not ours. Rather than saying, yes, and we're going to use your rules in these circumstances, and we're going to use our rules or lack of rules in these circumstances. And then we're going to experiment, and we're going to come back and talk about it. Uh, and so, you know, I think, again, it's, uh, it's not a magic recipe in any way, but it is taking the time uh, to, to, to give the space we need for both um, polarities, for both sides. And, you know, I think you know, as, a, as a team practice, finding your own language for it is a really great thing to do. So, you know, at the beginning of partnerships, you know, how can you sit in a room and name what are all the tensions that you imagine happening between between, you know, your different organizations or stakeholder groups? And, you know, we use, you know, we, we've tried all sorts of um, metaphors as well from like rubber bands and nails where we kind of literally make a board, a pegboard where we show what the tensions are. And then at each meeting, we can kind of come back to it and say how, you know, how wide do we think this tension is now or how taut or, you know, is it so tense that it's about to break the rubber band? Or, you know, can we find the middle ground position? So, you know, the, the, these are all things that then become um, part of the discourse or part of the water supply. Uh, and I think, you know, so much of teamwork and partnership working and relationship building uh, falls down because we just don't have the right conversations. Mm. And like you, <laughs> like you said about partnerships, it's all about trust. And being able to address these kind of topics is, I think, super important. And what, what I was thinking about, um, you said... We, we try to avoid conflicts. Um, we sort of pick, pick a side. Would be really interesting if there were playful ways to uh, address, uh, I was thinking about tension, but uh, to actually address opposite views and uh, maybe, maybe using humor or something like that, like yeah. more in a playful way rather than... Um, yeah. Bottom, bumping each other's heads? I don't know. That's not right. But. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, the, the, the terminology of yes and rather than either sure. or comes yeah. from improv theater. And so, you know, certainly, you know, our team did, you know, uh, an improv course, you know, a couple of years ago. And, and that um, the notion of kind of being able to be creative with things that seem quite opposing or diametrically different to one another um, is something that we've been really inspired by. So I think, you know, you certainly can get better at, at, you know, here's two situations and they seem like, whoa, how the hell can they go together? Um, and, but rather than treat them as that, like, let's find the yes and that can con connect them. Um, so yeah, yeah I that, think it is a skill set. Yeah. It, it requires a certain kind of clients that are open to actually explore these kind of tensions, right? That Absolutely. Yeah, and that that see it as worthy of one's time to be able to, to do this. It doesn't seem productive. We spend a whole day just talking about tension rather than talking about a project plan or a strategy. And again, that's another, for me, a litmus test of whether they're going to be the right kind of partner to do disruptive and transformative work because they recognize 
that that actually, you know, ideas aren't moving forward on just the the idea itself. They move forward on whether they have the right substrate or the right growing conditions. And the right growing conditions is um, it's going to be really tough. Getting any new concept to live in this world is really free freaking hard. And so um, we have to be able, just like you're raising a child in a relationship, to talk about all the really uncomfortable stuff, the stuff that, um, you know, requires us um, to to be courageous and to listen to stuff that we might not agree with and, um, you know, to muddle our way through uh, a, a different way of doing things. I I have deep respect for you the, in the way you're approaching this and how selective you are in the sort of people you're, well, <laughs> I, I can imagine that uh, you're, you're turning down a lot of potential projects just because there yeah, isn't a match yeah, or down us, I think is the important part of this as well. <laughs> both ways. Um, yeah. You know, I think, um, we're certainly not everybody's cup of tea. And then I say right away, if you're looking for a consultant, if you're looking to make better services, uh, we're not for you. There's many other organizations that would be a better fit for what your aims and objectives are. If you're looking to disrupt the status quo, if you're looking to redistribute power, if you're looking to re-envision what social support and welfare might look like five or ten years from now, we'd love to to get together and see if our values align. Um, and so it does mean that we're quite a niche organization. Yeah. We will always, I suspect, be quite small. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we're okay with that because for exactly. us, the mission is what's most important rather than the method or the approach or growth. Uh, and so it's, you know, having to accept uh, the limitations that come with being a bit of a selective or picky partner. Yeah, yeah. And at some point, your reputation starts to uh, follow you. Like uh, people... And then you, you you start to become the eighteen, <laughs> if if <laughs> right you, you become it, the 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 more niche you are, the more specialized you can become in a certain uh, field, and then I guess people will search and respect that. Yeah, hopefully. Sarah. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure. I think you're doing a great job. Um, <laughs> For the people who are listening and watching the Service Design Show, is there a question that you would like to ask us that we can ponder upon? Ah, great question. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, the question that I wake up with every morning, which is like, what does it mean to do purposeful and meaningful work in this context? Um, not just what does it mean to tick off my to-do list, but really where where does um, purpose and fulfillment come from? How, what kinds of interactions? Actions can you make happen that that can you know legitimately bridge a divide or um, create something uh, that that feels good? Um, and so you know I think uh, that that's always my challenge. So I, I would challenge uh, folks out there as well, you know, to 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 try and write and consider. Uh, um, you know, how, how does one move in a, in a more purposeful space uh, rather than a reactive space? You know, how does one um, take the time to consider, you know, do, are our ambitions, our outcomes, are those the right ones? According to whom? Um, and, you know, is there a voice that's missing? Who else do we need to be um, really considering and, and taking the time to listen to as we craft uh, our way forward? I uh, recommend people listening to this episode to go outside for a walk, take an hour, <laughs> because there's a lot of a lot to process and to think about. Uh, <laughs> and it's your fault, Sarah. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm known for giving people too much to think about on Mondays. <laughs> yeah, it's it, those are good questions, important questions as well. Um, anything else? If you if people want to connect with you, what's the best way to do so? You know, um, we uh, www.inwithforward.com uh, is uh, where we put much of our writing and, and thinking. Uh, and then you're welcome to email um, or, you know, tweet us or all, all methods lead back to us. But we, we certainly welcome conversation. We're also always looking for fabulous fellows to come um, add uh, their spark to our team. Uh, and uh, we also have an open role at the moment for a design director. So um, there if are- If you're near Vancouver or is it in Toronto, which one? 
So um, it's based in Vancouver. Okay. Well, if you're listening to this, who knows? <laughs> Awesome. Sarah, thanks so much for addressing uh, these topics. Uh, I think it's really important that we have these conversations. So once again, thanks. So what is your take on Sarah's question? Join the conversation, leave a comment down below, and who knows, your comment might just be the thing that sparks an insight with somebody else. I hope you found this episode helpful and inspiring. And if you did, make sure to grab the link and share it with just one other person today. That way you'll help to grow the service design show community and help me to invite more guests like Sarah here on the show. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next episode, which you can find over here. See you.